they are celebrating um, their anniversary this year. So I do want to bring up Axis as well. So Axis um, is a familiar group in this chamber. It is a community-based network of activists and caregivers that provide um, free and safe access to medical cannabis, particularly in our low-income and disabled uh, and veterans <coughs> communities. Um, they provided a necessary voice that we have heard, um, both here in this chamber and our committee rooms, um, supporting equitable policies on behalf of patients and providers. Um, the access also provides community meeting space, of which I've attended, um, and free meals during holidays to create community, um, uh, to create community amongst uh, this group uh, throughout the city. They have accomplished many things uh, over the last uh, couple of years, including the Office of Long Term Programming, which is the committee chair, John Conveyor's three-year letter to the DEA regarding questionable raids on clinics. They worked closely on the 2005 Medical Cannabis Act, working with our police commission and our board of supervisors. Uh, they teamed up with Supervisor David Campos to the Medical Cannabis Task Force. Um, the Patients Committee and Task Force gathered over 4,000 signed postcards um, to make this a reality. They've also testified <coughs> on numerous legislation, both at the state and local level, and also advocate for local prisoners um, throughout the country. And so I do want to thank you, um, one, for um, working to build community, which is so important. Um, here in our city, particularly, I think for many folks that have felt isolated or felt alienated um, in our neighborhood and our city, um, but also to provide the access that you do um, for many voices. So, uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for another good night to you. Uh, we will do that at Supervisor Campbell. Oh, sorry, before we do that, uh, Supervisor David Campbell also wants to say. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Campbell. Very briefly, I want to just uh, thank you for having the access. And uh, the point that I would make is that I think it's important that we move forward uh, with the, the new reality when it comes to uh, that the boys of uh, patients uh, is not forgotten. And I think that uh, I'm very grateful for the fact that that, that has been uh, the point of this organization to make sure that, that there is a room. There is a seat at the table for compassion and that the needs of patients uh, is taken into account. So I want to thank the as well for that. Well, um, thank you, Supervisor Kim and Supervisor Campos, for your kind words and your support, most importantly, of bringing patient advocacy to the table and seated. We have a lot of work to do this year. Um, we really are facing sort of an overall corporate takeover in many states that patient advocates have distinguished themselves from industry lobbyists and moving forward with low income uh, rights uh, to the policy tables to assure equity and safe access, meaning that poor patients are able to receive the same quality medicine as more affluent uh, patients and consumers. And that's one thing that Access of Love has provided for 15 years. We've made sure not only to uh, sort of talk the talk, but also walk the walk and um, be able to get um, compassion to, compassion meaning free medical cannabis to several people in our district uh, six. And um, I really want to thank the whole team. There's no way that any of this would be accomplished without the team that's caring and the spirit of volunteerism, which is um, just wonderful. You know, we have a community center, the longest running community center for patient advocates in our city. We just recently lost our, our space to uh, developers or uh, the, the dispensary next to us, we're not sure. But one thing that was just really wonderful is all the volunteers that would come into the community center to open it up to make sure that everything was ready for the veterans group, everything was prepared for the women's group. Um, even bingo seems inconsequential, but was huge in community building. And this is our city, this is our medicine, and 
we really thank uh, the progressive supervisors, the model supervisors, for acknowledging the patient cause. Thank you. In recognition of your work providing free and safe access to medical cannabis, particularly to low-income, disabled, and veterans communities, your strong ad advocacy for equitable policies on behalf of patients and providers, the Board of Supervisors extends its highest commendation and appreciation. Yay. This is a really wonderful day for us. It's prestigious. We got, we, we got some respect now. As we go into the next phase of looking for a new location, I want to let everybody know that we uh, have moved out um, of 1260 Mission, and here's why. What are we really close to? Mark. No. Mark. Twitter. So. We're so close to LED parks. So. We were the last community-based group to lose our space. St. James Infirmary, um, Needle Exchange, all these folks' buildings were being brought up left and right, right? And I knew, yeah. I knew our time was coming, right? So we received the first uh, sort of rent increase and that we were able to handle by, I talked to some friends into opening a gift shop. We did that for a year to try to maintain the space and then when it came time to renew our lease we had some uh, some problems because quite possibly somebody from the dispensary next door filed against us saying that we, we had been running an illegal MCD. So the city investigated and found that that claim was invalid. Meantime the owners of the building get a letter that says what the complaint was about. They were very elderly people. Oh boy. So Watch Fox they News. thought that that judgment had been made. So we had to talk them through and have them realize anybody can file a complaint and the city found the complaint invalid. That's good. Then they offered us a lease for another six months at double the rent. And there's no way that we could do that. And then we found out, we're like, hey, you know, if you give us a longer lease, maybe we can work something out where we can do this. Yeah. But what we found yeah. out yeah. was that they no longer, yeah. Yeah. No. they no longer own the building. Oh. So whether Sparks purchased it or another mega corporation, it really doesn't matter. That building is is not available anymore. So we've the been. Building? No, oh, I'm talking about our, our meeting space at 1260 Mission. Right next door to oh, the Sparks. Sparks. Yeah, and so now of course we have Sparks. You know. Uh, they have public relations people posting about how they've had all these great patient services and etc. <laughs> well, in Dope Magazine, they're boasting about how they've been there caring for people for years and cleaned up the neighborhood. And we all know that Axis of Love and Herbal Relief, our other neighbors, were the neighbors that cleaned up the neighborhood. Spark came in and they gentrified the neighborhood and worked with the developers and etc. So we see how in history often the conquistadors try to erase even your existence and the wonderful things that you try to build, right? You can't erase and we're dealing with corporate we're dealing with corporate bullyism and etc. But the point is we're still gathering. We're still coming together as a community. They can't stop that. We are unstoppable. We've been doing this since 2001 when we heard 
about the McBud plan. So when the feds first came through, they sat down with the club owners and they said, not nah, we're going to take you all out. We're going to take a few out and we want the rest of you to franchise. And in franchising, they decided to pull all the patient services. Uh -huh. And we weren't supposed to know about that, but I had some eyes and ears in that meeting. And then we started meeting at Golden Gate Park and telling people about the McBud plan and what and the corporate takeover of cannabis and the sort of pushing out of the community. What they really didn't like is people gathering and helping each other out, right? They don't they're fine with giving away free medicine as long as they can write it off on their taxes or be able to say that, you know, they donate to my tree or whatever so that they can have enough recommendations for their enormously huge and impactful uh, negative impact on the environment commercial grows, right? So whatever. We still continue to meet. We will always continue to do patient services and put patients first and foremost and this year we have the most daunting task which is going up against the worst state proposal called UMA and we have our own proposal called MCLR3. We're going to start gathering signatures and this Saturday the 13th we are going to continue medical cannabis week with a protest. There is a cannabis industry convention and the entrance to this guess how much it costs 7500 800 we've got 70 300. i'd get 50. 500 500. 500 it is between 500 and 800 dollars to go in that door so these are people who have made their fortunes on the backs of the sick and dying sent their children to private schools and now are going to attend a fancy <coughs> Dancy little industry soiree. Are we going to let him do it in peace? No. no. Are we going to be there to protest? Yeah. When is the thirteenth. So this is this Saturday. What time? Um, we are. Uh, it. It's going to be in the morning. I'm going to put a blast out on my Facebook uh, probably Friday evening and make sure that somebody in Access of Love has your number so that we can get a hold of you to be able to invite you to the protest. Can I bring you a sign? Yes. We'll text you. Um, it is going to be, I believe, at the Hilton. It's going to be at, 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 it's at a very fancy hotel. And a former attorney general is coming to speak. And we're going to make sure during this week that she hears, she's going to get a little letter from me about patient exploitation. Um, I'm not sure which one. Uh, I'll pull it up. I'll let everybody know. And then um, I'm wondering about how people feel on Valentine's. Um, meeting at Hippie Hill and taking a walk through the AIDS Memorial for 420 and puffing out folks that, that went before us. I, I, I know other people may have a date on <laughs> Valentine's, but I don't, so let's go to Hippie Hill 420, Valentine's Day and the 13th we're going to protest the industry's lockout of the patients because let me tell you, even a patient who is able-bodied enough to have a job in San Francisco would not be able to afford to walk in those doors. That is not for anybody that's even middle class, working class, or poor to be able to spend 500 to 800 dollars for, you know, a single day event. You know, it's just really, it's despicable. Um, it's tasteless. And we got to let them know it because last time uh, they had this is their second annual event. Last time I blasted them on Facebook and etc. And they said, Shona, you're a lone voice. And I can bring this and say something too. And you bring that and say something. And we're going to have people playing music and we are going to make sure that we're loud enough to disrupt their elitism nah. and their uncaring attitude towards the patients who made their fortune, right? Yeah.
If anybody would like sandwiches, etc., we still have some of that over there. We're going to roll up a little bit more medicine. Welcome to Liberal Buzz show. My name is Denise Dory, and I'm your host. Now tonight, my guest is going to be Brent Turner from KVOUS.org, and we're going to talk about open source voting, because what happens when you vote? Okay, let's talk about this. I wore my Rey Mysterio t-shirt, and it's kind of... to to express how uh, complex codes are mysterious and they're going to bully us into thinking that uh, it's okay for them to only be the only, for Microsoft and Diebold to be the only ones that know the, to how to unlock those codes so that we can count our votes properly. So uh, you can vote all you want, but if you, you don't have the votes counted properly, it's not going to work. And even paper ballots end up in the bay, so anyway. <laughs> Oracle and Microsoft are holding elections hostage. Your votes are only as good as the secret intellectual mic uh, Microsoft uh, vote machine codes allow. From California Association of Voting Officials, my guest Brent Turner, and uh, oh, I guess you might have seen him on my show before. Uh, my guest Brent Turner here. So he'll be calling at around 6.03. So let me do the intro so I can bring you up to speed. The San Francisco uh, Board of Elections has decided to start putting $2.3 million into open source publicly owned voting syst uh, uh, election syst uh, voting systems. So that's great. Um, now, uh, Election results are fair, only you know, only as fair as the voting machines uh, allow, and with no oversight, and the, the code being way too complex for even a whole room full of software engineers to decipher, even if they can get close enough to it, uh, isn't fair. So, um, I mean, the way it is now, it could get us a Trump or a Cruz, President uh, President Trump or Cruz. Um, the voter machine market is run by Diebold using Microsoft code. They ain't sharing it, and you need to. Um, so Clinton and Sanders both favor open source voting software. Now, now the uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign is suspicious of Microsoft, very suspicious of Microsoft's role in the Iowa caucus last Tuesday. Um, Microsoft provided the software free. You know the software that we don't know how to crack it. So, um, hell, I can't even buy a camera and use it on the Windows 10 anymore because they, you know, it's too proprietary. And that's what the, when Microsoft has got really gotten more and more proprietary lately. So, um, last year the Democrats and the GOP both, it's bipartisan, this voter software. Um, they, uh, in an I Iowa, announced a new app for both parties. Last, uh, they announced it last year. Um, the precinct chairman report their election results to the headquarters, and both parties trust Microsoft enough to use a platform built on Microsoft tech and stored in Microsoft Cloud, claiming security, accuracy, and speed. Um, while well, we don't, and they want us to, tr you know, just trust us. So. And they want, they want us to trust an app vital to democracy without seeing it. And um, so are the Iowa Democrats and Republicans naive? Or did they drink the Kool-Aid <laughs> you know, by trusting Microsoft free voting software? And now we've got New, New Hampshire going on. That's next. And uh, they'll be running open source front end. But then the back end is going to be the same old proprietary software that's going to be you know, business as usual, poisoning the well in New Hampshire. So the breaking news we've got 
I'll get to it now. Ah, I think that's my guess. Brent! Is that you, Brent? Yes, it is. Denise? Oh, fantastic. Good to hear from you. Thanks for calling. Oh, you're more than welcome. We're, we're in direct competition with the Democratic candidates tonight. Ah. We are. Uh, we, but they're going to show this over and over every day for two weeks. So this oh, beautiful. Yes. Hey, I just wanted to, to let you feel my loyalty by calling in exactly on time regardless. You most certainly did. I'm thrilled. <laughs> you just thrilled me to death. You just really did. Thank you. I'll have to buy you dinner. Okay, beautiful. So, um... Uh, are we live? Yes, we are. Uh, okay. Bring, so, uh, bring us up to speed. Now, you are from... Uh, tell the viewers you're, you're from the, uh, uh... You're from... My, my association? Yeah, from, uh, cavo.us.org is your, is your website. That's right. That's the California Association of Voting Officials. Yes, I, I wrote, I, uh, introduced you earlier. Oh, was it? So, uh, as a California associate, yeah, that's right. Okay, I had it right in the beginning. Okay, um, so, now bring us up to speed with San Francisco uh, well, Department we, of Elections. As you know, Denise, we've been working for over a decade on this issue of making sure that the election systems are functioning with proper security, um, which is really a software issue. That currently the systems utilize a Microsoft platform with vendor-owned code, and uh, the Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, previous to Alex Padilla, uh, her top-to-bottom reviewed was scathing and conclusive regarding the lack of appropriate security with the current voting systems in the United States. Yeah. So um, our work has been to provide solution to that, specifically uh, general public license open source software uh, to replace the software code uh, that is put together by the vendors. And we want Microsoft out of the equation as well. So in the last uh, week, we've managed to get into the budget through the Department of Elections in San Francisco, and uh, they're funding it to the tune of 2.3 million for the first year, with the idea being if we can put a system together uh, that would approximately run around 6 million, that would put San Francisco in a position of having a certified system, and they would no longer have to spend $15 million every few years uh, as right now they're in a vendor trap where every few years they have to spend you know upwards of 15 million dollars uh, for substandard systems so this would be a publicly owned system uh, that we could share with other counties and other counties across the country could actually participate financially so our initial cost of six million may be reduced, but even at six million, it's saving nine million in its first cycle. And of course, it's just not a financial issue. It's also the sanctity of the vote count to make sure democracy is functioning properly. San Francisco would lead the state and the country uh, toward these better systems. Yeah, I understand there's no open source voting in California, so we would set, that would set a precedent for us. And for yeah. once, I can thank Scott Weiner for something. Yay. Um, That's right. You know, Scott is, is a good guy on this. He's, he's smart on it. Yeah. And then uh, also uh, Jane Kim yeah. and, and London Breed. Yeah. And, um, uh, of course, uh, you, you know, the, the regulars, uh, Eric Marr and and John Avalos. Yeah. Uh, Progressives. They're, they're all smart on this. Mark Farrell as well. Uh, you know, on and on. I think we're at an 11 to 0 on the board. Uh, no, nobody wants to be the one that stood in the way of this benefit to democracy. But now, of course, we're going to have to clear some hurdles with uh, Mayor Lee 
to make sure he doesn't cut it out of his budget. Uh oh. Okay, and that and is, do you think that you expect anything dodgy coming out of that? Well, of course, our role is to trust nothing. And so we will be at the ready to fight the battle right until we see these systems put together and deployed out into the field. Uh, that's our position is we, we trust, but we verify everything. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's already vendors claiming that there's open source voting software, and, and then it turns out to be proprietary. That's correct. That's what they're doing in... I believe that's the state of the project in Travis County, Texas, as Microsoft is a partner there. And then also Los Angeles County is doing open source, but they won't address their licensing issue. And our position is it must be the highest standard, which is general public license, yeah. called GPL, open source. That what protects against shenanigans in the open source environment uh, and there are shills out there for Microsoft that would like to create nouveau licenses that would take us down the slippery slope to a proprietary system all over again. So we, we have to watchdog everything constantly. So now didn't the Department of Justice try to fix it by enforcing antitrust laws? The Department of Justice uh, came in with antitrust issues. Uh, that, that was regarding the too big to fail uh, ESNS. Uh, there's only a few vendors in the marketplace, and they've gobbled up other companies. So Diebold and um, Pr uh, Premier is now Dominion. And so that only leaves Dominion, ESNS, and Heart Inner Civic. Uh, so there's just a few vendors, which is really inappropriate. Uh, of course, open source and publicly owned systems will break up that situation as well. Now, didn't the government uh, test the current, uh, they call for tests of the current systems and they concluded that the system is unacceptably deficient? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it go back to 2007 or some the old software go back to the Kerry election? The, yeah, this software has been in place since the early 2000s. After the Hanging Chad episode, there was a 4.5 billion with a B uh, Help America Vote Act that bought the initial round of these electronic systems, and since then we've been using the same basic systems. Um, the 2007 mark that you're talking about was what, what I mentioned, the Secretary of State Bowen's top to bottom review. Uh, that's been one government study. Uh, there's been numerous, the Everest study out of Ohio, I believe, and, and other studies that have all concluded the same situation that it's just unacceptable from a security perspective. Um, 